Well, thank you all for being uh, present at, at my session, um, being one of the last one. Um, so I am Thierry Depau, I'm from, uh, from Belgium. Um, English is my third language, so <laughs> bear, bear with me. Um, I'm a continuous delivery coach, I'm an independent continuous delivery coach, so that is I uh, help organizations and teams um, adopt all the uh, technical and organizational practices that allow them to uh, create a fast flow of work through their uh, value stream and so get into a state of continuous delivery. So we say that an organization is, is, is um, in a state of continuous delivery when it is able to satisfy business demand and so that they can uh, deliver frequent and reliable product increments. Um, so I don't care much about the tooling so I think that the tooling part of the problem is, is, is the most easy one. So I care more about the, the practices that make uh, continuous delivery and I'm, I'm especially coaching about this. And um, while well regarding this, well, this session is specifically about a practice that in my opinion is rather um, disabling continuous delivery and bringing uh, organizations into what we can call a discontinuous delivery state. Um, the session is, is based on the experience I gained working with two quite different teams. Um, so somewhere in 2012 I had the uh, possibility to start a technical coaching mission um, to improve the software engineering skills of a rather novice team inside of what I would call a very, very, very waterfall organization. And when I arrived there, I discovered a situation that I wasn't quite expecting to still discover in 2012. So nobody um, in this team, except for one, um, was using any version control system. So code was shared among the team through, well, well of course, through shared drives. Like, well, that's why shared drives are for, isn't it? So. First thing we did when we arrived, and, and while well, I speak about we, because I wasn't alone coaching this team, we were the two of us, which was a great thing. So the first thing we did was, um, well, we introduced version control. And because this was a novice team, um, well, we thought that, um, well, adopting Git would be a bridge too far. And so we went for the safe solution and we adopted Subversion. It's very easy to use. Um, you have three simple operations. You check out code, you modify it, and you check it in again. Simple, easy, anyone can, uh, can learn this. And we also decided to, well, we won't do, do any branching at all because it was said that with Subversion, branching was, well, rather difficult compared with Git, better than with CVS, but still difficult. So, well, no, no branching at all. So everyone in the team was committing into um, a trunk immediately. And that worked pretty well because, well, the second thing we introduced was, well, we introduced continuous integration right from the start. And that evolved over time into um, continuous delivery. Now, the funny thing is that at the time, I actually didn't know that this way of working actually had a name. People were starting to call that trunk-based development to make this distinction f with continuous integration that everybody was using, but in fact wasn't practicing. And we will see why. Um, now, over time, the team evolved, gained maturity, and then we thought, well, let's go to Git. Um, let's migrate to Git because, well, there is more tooling available for Git and because we wanted to adopt the pull request-based model of code reviews and as such using feature branches. Yay. Now, <laughs> that was a great idea. Um, now, well, what works very well in the open source world doesn't necessarily work very well in um, a co-located team inside an enterprise organization. And, and as Jess says, like all powerful tools, there are many ways to use them and not all of them are good. And here he refers to the fact of using feature branches and the fact that uh, proponents of distributed version control systems are using feature branches to sell um, uh, distributed version control systems. And that this makes everybody blind for the problems that arise from the use of feature branches. 
And, and we've actually had those problems and we tried to find solutions and, 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 and we, we came up with ever complex processes and ever complex technical solutions and that actually didn't solve our problems. And then in the end, we decided, well, let's go back to trunk-based development. That, that worked and, and we never looked back. Now, sometime later, I, I got the opportunity to start another coaching mission in, in another organization, very agile organization, highly skilled software engineers, but they were using GitFlow as a branching strategy. Now, with the experience I gained um, using trunk-based development with a role of novice team, I thought, well, this is the right environment to introduce trunk-based development. Th these are highly skilled engineers that must be able to introduce this. And so I tried this. And like Iqbal says, while trying to convince people and especially highly skilled software engineers about the benefits of trunk-based development, it's not an overnight task. It's quite difficult. And every time I suggest it in the software engineering community, I get always the same reaction. I, I get people staring at me like I'm stupid. Um, are you insane? <laughs> Are you suggesting everybody is going to, to, to commit into mainline? It, it, it's going to be a mess. Uh, yeah. So, trunk-based development is um, still the most controversial practice in the Agile community, although it is implied by continuous integration. And so I, I failed, and I, I miserably failed to um, introduce trunk-based development in this, in this organization, partly because I lacked the experience working with teams that uses some kind of branching strategy. Um, or, well, or better said, I, I, I have worked in such teams, but I never really paid attention to the problems that arise. And so I took this opportunity this time to, well, let's see, let's see what happens. Um, and, and, and this resulted in this presentation um, that I'm sharing with you. So, before we go on, and to make sure that we all speak the same language, I want to introduce some definitions and to make sure that we are all aligned. And so the first definition is, well, what is mainline development? What is mainline? Well, mainline is your line of development that is the reference from where builds are created and that feed into your pipeline. So for Git, this is master. For subversion, this is trunk. For the others, I don't know. Um, and, and what is feature branching? Well, feature branching is a practice where people do not merge their work back into mainline until the feature they are working on is done, but not yet done done. So done means it is dev complete, but there's still a lot of work to be done before you get it into production and release to real users and used by real users. So, your implementation of your feature starts by creating a branch, you grow the feature on that branch, and when the feature is finished, well, you merge, you merge, the back, you merge back the branch into mainline, and then you don't forget to delete the branch. So, when we speak about feature branching, we are actually speaking about long-lived branches, and long-lived means longer than a day. So, and, and this differs from GitHub's definition of feature branches, and, and this, this is part of all the confusion that exists um, uh, with people when you say that feature branching is evil. Yeah, but GitHub is suggesting that. Yeah, well, but GitHub is in fact speaking about what I would call task branches. These are short-lived branches. And, and at GitHub, features are actually split in smaller things that are each individually um, deployable into, into production. And so, so, and this creates a lot of confusion. So, feature branching is in fact long-lived branches. What is continuous integration? Well, continuous integration is a practice that ensures always working software and, and, and that ensures you get feedback within minutes whether your change broke the application or not. And this involves, um, like uh, we heard in the, in the keynote this morning, and this is the, the Jess Humble continuous integration uh, uh, certification test. Well, Everybody is committing into mainline at least once a day. Every commit triggers an automated uh, build and test, and when the build fails, it gets fixed within 10 minutes. Now, continuous integration is actually a practice. You, in fact, don't need any tooling to do this. It's, it's, it's just a practice. And if you want to know more about this, because, well, I could explain more, but I'm a bit short on time for this, 
Go read the blog post of James Shaw that is called um, Continuous Integration on a Dollar a Day. It's a very funny blog, po blog post, but he explains very well what is the practice of continuous integration. By the way, um, all references that I'm giving, um, at the end of the slide deck, there is a huge list of resources where, where you can uh, find um, all the resources. Um, and then lastly, uh, what is the goal of software development? So the goal of software development is not necessarily um, to deliver software. It is in fact to sustainably reduce your lead time to create positive business impact. And so lead time is your clock wall time between we as a team have an idea and this idea is implemented and uh, deployed into production and released to users and used by these, these users. And uh, positive business impact is anything that either creates money for your organization, so this is the turnover, um, saves money for your organization, this is cost reduction, and protects money for your organization, this is beating your competition. And so we want to reduce this lead time because we want to have early feedback on the features we are releasing to the users. We want to see how the user is using this feature. And based on that, we can then take new decisions and eventually run new experiments into production. Now, to be able to suggest strength-based development again, I had to understand why teams are using long-running branches. What problems are they trying to solve? And so I asked around and I got some responses. And so the first one I got is, well, it allows us to work in isolation and as such we are more productive. Well, yeah, seems fair, isn't it? Seems very obvious, but isn't that not some kind of local optimization that we are doing here? And isn't Lean saying that, well, local optimizations most of the time are working against global optimizations? So what we are in fact doing here is optimizing for um, individual, produ uh, individual uh, developer productivity. And um, now, as we all know, Software development is not really an individual effort, it is a team effort. And so your team will only go as fast as the slowest merge. As long as you haven't merged back your branch into mainline, you actually don't know how much work is left to do. You don't know how much um, merge conflicts you will have and how much uh, rework you will eventually have to do because of those merge conflicts. And so this makes your software delivery process very, very unpredictable. And an unpredictable software delivery process will impact your lead time and as such your time to market. So, and remember, software engineering is about reducing the lead time to create positive business impact. And so, instead of optimizing for individual uh, developer productivity, well, we should better um, optimize for team productivity. Um, the second reason I got was, well, if we are doing a refactoring and this refactoring goes nowhere, well, we have the ability to delete it by deleting the branch. Very easy, isn't it? Yeah, again, fair enough. But what I actually think they are saying is, well, we have this problem and we don't know the solution right away. So we are just trying something, hoping that we get to a solution in the end. Now, if you don't know the solution immediately, why not spike out some ideas? And this is the whole purpose of a spike. The purpose of a spike is to write some throwaway code to test your ideas. Now, the output of a spike is not production code. The output of a spike is knowledge. You are creating knowledge and you should have um, you should have an idea in, in, in a couple of hours if, if, if your ideas are working out or not. Um, if it did work out, no, if it, didn't, if it didn't work out, well, no problem, just throw away the code and try again. If it did work out, good, again, throw away the code, start over again, but this time with the knowledge that you created, and this time you are going to implement this in small incremental steps. Um, the third reason I got was, well, it allows us to control quality um, by, well, 
only uh, code gets merged into mainline because we have this gating process at, 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 at merging time. Now, isn't that the purpose of having continuous integration or by extension continuous delivery? So continuous integration and continuous delivery, um, well, the purpose of them is to eliminate uh, bad quality release candidates as, as early as possible and, and only changes that went through all stages of your pipeline and that have thoroughly been tested get into production. In my opinion, this is the only effective way to control the quality of what goes into production. And lastly, I got, well, we can control the features that go into production. Well, in fact, what they are trying to do is preventing that unfinished features get into production because these are sitting on the branches. As long as the branches not merge back into mainline, it doesn't get into production. Now, <laughs> um, what we are in fact doing here is using the version control system to turn features off and on through manual merge. And so we are creating a poor man's modular architecture and instead we should um, uh, design our applications to um, allow us to turn features off and on at uh, uh, deploy time or at runtime. Okay, so why, why, is this, why, why is this a problem? Why is using long-lived branches a problem? Well, first of all, it will delay feedback. So as long as you haven't merged your branch back into mainline, you absolutely don't know if your changes broke the application or not. It's only at the time that you are merging back to mainline that your continuous integration process is triggered. And remember, continuous integration is this practice that ensures always working software and to get feedback within minutes if your change broke the application or not. And, and there, is, there is the problem with lots of teams. They are redefining continuous integration by saying, well, we have these automated builds running against our branches. Well, having automated builds running against your branches is a good thing. It's a really good thing, but it's not continuous integration. Um, you only get feedback on uh, whether your application still compiles inside this branch and whether you haven't introduced any regressions against the test battery that is sitting inside this branch. You don't get any feedback on whether your changes um, um, integrate well with the changes of everybody else. And, and the rest of the team doesn't see your changes. So you are, in fact, in continuous isolation. So outside, uh, outside work doesn't get integrated and the rest of the team doesn't see your work. Um, it also hinders the integration of your features. So if you are developing multiple features at the same time and, um, and, and, uh, um, and, and you are doing this in parallel, well, integrating these features uh, becomes harder and harder with the number of features you are deploying, uh, you are developing in, in parallel, and the number of changes that are required to implement those features. Now, you could reduce this integration problem by adopting something that Martin Fowler calls promiscuous integration. So, in order to, to, to use the changes sitting in, in another branch, well, you could cherry-pick commits from that other branch into your branch, and so you are actually communicating uh, changes between branches uh, from then on. But, well, the biggest concern Martin Fowler has about uh, promiscuous integration as well. First of all, it introduces process complexity. And second, well, you lose track about who has what on which branch. And so, so compare this complexity with the simplicity of uh, having everybody committing directly into mainline. Um, as long as you haven't uh, merge back to your, your branch into, um, into mainline, well, the rest of the team doesn't know in which direction you are taking the code to implement your feature. Um, so this is fine as long as everybody in the team is working on different um, areas of the code base, but the minute that two persons of the team are working on the same uh, code base area, they are each blind uh, for, uh, for how their changes will affect the other person. On the other hand, if you are committing regularly into mainline, 
um, you are communicating with the rest of the team in which direction you are taking the code. And so, for instance, you could introduce a conditional in the code base indicating, well, hey, I'm introducing those changes here. I'm implementing this new feature here. And the rest of the team can see those changes. Now, you could argue that introducing um, an, a conditional in your code base adds complexity to your code base. And yes, yes, you are right. This is introducing complexity. On the other hand, by using a branch and not introducing this conditional, well, the conditional is still there. It is not gone. But it's less visible and it's absolutely not obvious because from then on, this conditional is the branch of your version control system. And from then on, all your changes are invisible for the rest of your team. Uh, because you are hiding work for the rest of your team, it also works against uh, refactoring. So if you have two persons working on two different features in parallel, um, one person uh, performs um, some refactoring on his branch, uh, merges back to mainline, second person has a significant amount of changes sitting on, hi uh, on, on his branch and wants to merge back, while well, merging back for him will be uh, far more difficult and most of the time he will be angry. Now, the longer your branch lives, the more refactoring you are performing on this branch, while well, the harder it will become to merge back into mainline, and because of merge conflicts, because of, uh, of, of rework, and so, in the end, your team will slow down. Um, and um, s um, because your team is slowing down, this will be a strong force to discourage the use of uh, refactoring. Now, we all know that not refactoring will not pay back the technical debt. And not paying back the technical debt, well, leads to crappy code. And crappy code makes it harder to add new functionality. And so, in the end, your team will again slow down. And so you are in this vicious circle where your team will slow down, slow down, slow down. And so the lead time will increase over time and nobody really understanding why this is happening. Um, when we use feature branches, we are in fact introducing some kind of, some kind of batch work. Um, so the longer the branch lives, the more work is created on the branch, so the bigger the batch size is created. Uh, and so the bigger the batch size, uh, the more work in progress is created. And from Lean, we know that work in progress is nothing more than inventory, and inventory is money stuck in the system. It is stuck in the system because your organization invested a lot of money to create this code, to create this inventory, but it doesn't generate any revenue for the, uh, for, for the organization as long as this code is not integrated in your product. As long as it is not integrated in your product, it is not, um, uh, you don't get any feedback on how this code is going to behave in, in, in production. Now, to reduce this inventory, we have to reduce the work in progress, and this means working in smaller batches. So this means committing more regularly into mainline, and so integrating more often, adopting continuous integration. And adopting continuous integration will bring you closer to a single piece flow. And again, from Lean, we know that single piece flow will increase your throughput, reduce your lead time, and uh, reduce your time to market. It will also increase risks. The um, longer your branch lives, more work is created on the branch, the bigger the change sets are. And so bigger change sets means more risk. Why is this? Well, if you are committing frequently into mainline, your CI process will uh, process smaller batch sizes. And so if the build breaks, well, finding the root cause will be, f will be easy because the batch size is, uh, the, the, the change set is small. On the other hand, if you are working with long-lived branches, well, you end up with bigger change sets. And so your CI process has to uh, process um, uh, bigger change sets. And so if the build break, finding the root cause will be far more difficult. And so you are running the risk of not being able to fix the build within 10 minutes. And then starts the risk that you end up with a situation where the build is always broken. And so you lose monitoring on the health of your application, and so you lose track on whether your application is always releasable or not. And lastly, well, specifically for GitFlow, it creates lots of overhead, cognitive overhead. So whenever you have to switch work between features, um, you have to switch between branches, 
to reduce merge complexity, you have to rebase uh, master onto your branch. Um, to communicate changes between features, you have to cherry pick, and when the feature is finished, well, you may not forget to delete uh, the branch, otherwise you end up with a repository having lots and lots of branches, nobody knowing wherefore they are there, nobody daring to remove them, and so introducing another kind of technical debt. So, how can we avoid all of this? Well, by adopting continuous integration as it was meant when introduced by the XP community in the late 90s. Yeah, somewhere t almost 20 years ago. So nothing new here. So, and the core principle of continuous integration is to have always working software that is releasable from mainline. And this is the most important practice to adopt to enable fast flow of work through your value stream. And this implies the adoption of trunk-based development. Um, trunk-based development is what individuals or pair practice individually to collectively achieve continuous integration. So trunk-based development is a version control strategy where everybody in the team is uh, committing multiple times a day into mainline, either through very short-lived branches, either directly, by, uh, directly committing onto mainline. And so as a result, change sets are small, merge conflicts are less likely, and so your code base is releasable. And testing happens on, on mainline, and ideally, releasing happens from mainline. Now, if the release needs stabilization, you can opt for very short-lived release branches that are deleted immediately after that the, the uh, release has been done. So, trunk-based development doesn't mean no branching at all. It just means you use very short-lived branches. How do we get there? How do we get to trunk-based development without, um, um, without it becoming a mess for the rest of the team? Something that uh, most people are uh, very afraid of when you speak about trunk-based development. So there are some practices to adopt. Um, and, and, well, I identified four of them. And the first, the first one is, well, in my opinion, the most important one to adopt. And I have to say, it's most of the time also the hardest one to adopt. And this is what we call um, incremental software development. So break up um, large changes into a series of small incremental changes, making sure you have always working software. Um, Steve Freeman and Annette Price make this analogy with surgery in their book uh, Growing um, Object-Oriented Software Guided by Test, where they say that, well, surgeons prefer keyhole surgery because it's less invasive and it is cheaper. So we like um, incremental software development and working in small incremental steps because, well, it is less invasive. Um, you are not ripping apart your application and, 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 and as such, it is cheaper because um, your application is always releasable and always working at any given moment in time. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that you always commit on green. And this is where test-driven development supports string-based development. So you start by writing a small uh, failing test, you grow the code until the test is green, and you commit. And then you start a refactor cycle. If the test is red, you throw it away, start over again until it is green, and then you commit again. Second thing is um, you absolutely need a decoupled code base. Um, if you don't have a decoupled code base, well, any change will ripple through all layers of your application, ripping apart your, app, uh, ripping apart your application. And this is why solid principles are so important. And this is where architecture styles like clean architecture, ports and adapters, or hexagonal architecture will help you. And lastly, you absolutely need lots and lots and lots of tests. And when I speak about tests, these are really unit tests. Um, this is what will give you the confidence that you are not breaking anything. And they need to be absolutely fast, incredibly fast, because your developers will um, execute those tests over and over and over and over again before committing. If, if if these tests are slow, well, either people tend to not run them, and so you run the risk to break the build, 
or they run them less frequently and so they are batching changes together, introducing again batch work, something that we don't want. Um, the second practice is the most easy one to adopt. If you have unfinished functionality, well, just hide it. It's perfectly acceptable to have unfinished functionality sitting in production, even sitting behind a publicly accessible URL, as long as this URL is not accessible, or no, well, as long as it is not discoverable by the end user. So if you are uh, adding a new screen to your user interface, and the screen is not yet finished, well, just don't add a menu item um, in your menu. Menu. Only add this menu item uh, when the screen is finished. It's very easy. You don't need fancy feature toggling for this. The third one is about refactoring. If you have to perform large-scale refactoring, like, for instance, well, let's say something crazy. Um, you want to replace your, your UI framework by the uh, latest, newest, fancy UI framework. Or you want to replace your persistence layer by another persistence layer. So really large scale, impacting your whole application. So the usual thing teams are doing is, well, well, let's create a branch to do this and do this whole refactoring. And so what happens is, well, in, in the meantime, uh, features are being added, merging back becomes a hell, or features are not being added because we are waiting until this refactoring is done. And so you are, uh, you are breaking your flow. Now, instead of doing um, uh, branch by version control, well, use branch by abstraction. And branch by abstraction is a practice that allows you to do those large-scale refactoring without breaking the flow of your delivery, um, still keeping your application working, still being able to release, and still being able to add functionality to your code base while performing this refactoring. So. How does, how does this work? Um, well, you start from a situation where you have various parts of your code base that is calling some supplier code. So the code that you want to replace by something else. So the first thing you do is, well, you introduce an abstraction layer. So in OO languages, this would be an interface and your supplier code becomes an implementation of this interface. And then you gradually start moving your client code to use this, um, this abstraction layer and you immediately start implementing a second implementation for this abstraction layer. And then you start swapping out this old supplier code and replace it by the new supplier code. Now I have to say this adds quite some complexity to your code base. You have to think hard, you will move slower, but you have the added benefit of having always working software, never breaking the flow of your delivery, and, and, and always being able to release. And then the last uh, uh, practice that you can adopt, now in my opinion this should be your last resort, uh, you should first master the three orders before taking this one, because well, feature toggle is very fancy, but it, it has his fair share of, uh, of problems, and, and, and it can introduce his fair share of, um, of technical depth. So use feature toggling to decouple code deployment from feature release, uh, something that we call dark launching. So you are in fact able to deploy your feature into, into production days or weeks before it has been released to the, um, uh, to the user. And this has the benefit that you can, that you can um, test this feature in a real production environment without impacting the user. And when you are fine with this feature, you can start gradually releasing it to the end user and see how it behaves when it is used by the user. And if a problem arises, well, no problem. You can just roll back at runtime, anytime. Now, we can identify different kinds of feature toggles, um, and they are categorized um, according to two dimensions. So, um, the lifetime of the toggle, so how long are they living, and um, how dynamic the toggle decision is. And so the first one that we identify is release toggles. So they are very short-lived, usually uh, one to two weeks, and once the, 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 the feature has been um, um, released, those toggles are removed from the code base, and they are very static. 
um, these are uh, configurations inside a configuration file, which means switching, uh, switching the toggle needs um, or requires um, a new version of the application. The second one are ops toggles. They are more dynamic than the release toggles, but most of the time uh, also short-lived, but could be very long-lived. So they, they are used to help you with operational tasks, like gradually releasing a feature, having an unclear performance. Um, so once you gain enough confidence in, in the feature, you can then decide to remove the toggle. Um, toggle decision is based on, on runtime information and, and the long-lived ones are, are most of the time used to kill features when the uh, application is under high load. So allowing you to do a graceful uh, degradation and so keeping the core functionality of the application while removing the side functionality, making sure that core functionality is still working. Um, the third ones are experiment toggles. The, the, these are the ones that you use for A-B testing. Uh, highly dynamic, toggle decision is based on runtime information, but short-lived. You only keep them as long as necessary to um, gain um, enough statistical, uh, statistically uh, significant data so that you can take a decision. And lastly, we have the permission toggles, highly dynamic. Um, most of the time, um, toggle decision is evaluated on a per-request basis and uh, they are used to unlock features for premium users, beta users, or they are used for access control. So therefore, they are most of the time also very long-lived. Now, feature toggles when done badly can be evil too. So they can be a, a, a source of quite some technical, uh, quite some technical depth. Um, so, uh, first of all, well, um, as already said, we want to limit our work in progress, so we want also to limit the number of active toggles. Whenever a toggle is not needed anymore, you just remove it from the code base. Otherwise, you run the risk of having a code base with lots and lots of toggles, nobody knowing wherefore they are used, so nobody daring to, to remove them. Um, and second, toggles introduce branching logic in your code base. So therefore, your application needs to be tested um, with the toggle on and off. And also, well, because of the branching logic, well, you run a risk of maintainability if you don't implement it the right way. Um, Pete Hodgson wrote a very good blog post on, on this, or a very good article on feature toggles, um, and it was published on Martin Fowler's uh, bl uh, blog, and it's called, of course, Feature Toggles, and he explains very well how to, um, how to correctly implement uh, toggles without shooting yourself in the foot. Now, when I, um, when I suggest the adoption of trunk-based development, I regularly get some questions asked from, from the audience, and I, I wanted to share those two with you. Those, it's only two questions. And the first one was, well, how big should the story then be in order to adopt trunk-based development? Uh, should we um, introduce uh, technical stories? Should we split our stories into tasks? Well. Regardless if you use feature branching or that you use trunk-based development, your stories should always be as small as possible and still deliver business value to your users. Having small stories will again enable the fast flow of work through your, through your value stream. So no, we don't want technical user stories and no, we don't want stories to be split into, in, into tasks. On the other hand, um, we don't want stories to be that small that they fit one commit, because if we do that, we are introducing batch work. Um, so, recall the second practice, hide unfunction unfinished functionality. You can absolutely implement your stories using a series of commits. Um, so you don't need small stories for that, and, and, and therefore, in my opinion, there is no real correlation between story size and the ability to adopt trunk-based development. Now, what about code reviews? How do we do code reviews with trunk-based development? Yeah, we don't, we cannot do the pull request thingy. Um, well, so code reviews are important. Um, 
that's a fact. It helps um, um, gain the shared understanding of the code base. It helps improving the skills of your uh, of your team, and it helps um, improve quality of the code base. So therefore, all commits need to be reviewed. Now. If you do pair programming or you do mob programming, well, you in fact have continuous code review for free before the code is being committed into mainline. Because while the code is being written, several pairs of eyes are looking at this, uh, at this code and evaluating if this is the right thing to do. And in most XP shop, this is good enough as code review. Um, if you don't do pair programming, or you do pair programming, but you still want a formal code review, well, you still have several options. And so the first one is, yeah, you adopt the pull request model and you work with very short branches. Well, quite, quite some pictures. Um, and uh, the last one is, well, you could also just do the code reviews on master after the commit has happened. Yeah, but wait a minute. <laughs> Aren't we running the risk of having bad quality code going into production? Yes, you are totally right. And personally, I don't see a problem in this. Bad quality doesn't mean a bug. Code reviews aren't there to find bugs. For bugs, we have the test battery. Test batteries are there to, ca to, to, catch, uh, to catch the bugs. Code reviews are there for improving code quality. So. And the other thing is, we said, every commit will be reviewed. So in the end, this bad quality will be, will be caught by a code review and fixed in an upcoming release. But for this to work, you need team commitment that any time you find a quality problem during a code review, this is picked up with high priority and fixed immediately. Now, what are the benefits? What are the benefits of adopting trunk-based development? Well, if you are uh, committing frequently into mainline, you are creating builds more frequently. And if you, are committing, if you are creating builds more frequently, well, you are able to deploy more frequently. And if you are deploying more frequently, well, you are reducing your lead time and reducing your time to market. Now, um, also, because you are deploying more frequently into production, you are also able to run more experiments and try more ways to delight your customer. And this is a huge competitive advantage that you have there. And as a side effect, you also will be able to um, catch problems earlier, fix them immediately, building quality into your product, and this will lead to higher stability and higher quality. Um, Nicole Forsgren and Jess Humble um, brought, um, well, published a research paper, so a peer-reviewed academic research paper on continuous delivery, and they and they did that in 2016, and they they've proven that uh, trunk-based trunk development and continuous integration are a statistically significant predictor of high-performing IT organizations. And that trunk-based development um, is a predictor of um, higher throughput and better stability. Now, to conclude, where is the evilness? We haven't talked about the evilness of, of, of feature branching. Well, because feature branching is more like a symptom treatment. Um, um, it's, it's, it's not really a solution for a root cause. We are trying to solve symptoms. And, and the evilness is hiding behind the use of feature branches. And specifically, the real reasons teams are using feature branches for. And, 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 and in my opinion, well, the real reason is either they are unable um, or they lack the incremental software development skills, um, or they lack uh, the necessary automated tests, or they have a two-coupled code base um, and, and, and resulting in every change, breaking the application and, and creating lots and lots of merge conflicts, or finally they have slow builds, preventing um, their developers to run the build regularly or, 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 or even worse, developers not running the build locally before they are committing and so introducing broken builds. So. Adopting trunk-based development is 
isn't easy. It is. It is quite hard. It, it's like it's like adopting test-driven development. It, it's something that you have to learn. It's something that you have to practice. You have to see others do it. Well, that's how I learned test-driven development. It's also how I learned trunk-based development. But well, once you have adopted it, you cannot really imagine another world, and you cannot imagine going back. And I think in the um, HP LaserJet uh, uh, book. Um, where um, they adopted continuous delivery uh, for the production of the laser, laser jet firmware, well, that was the conclusion of the development teams that, well, they couldn't imagine going back to using branches. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. It's really practical and everyone should uh, make great use of it. Uh, I just wanted to comment, like, um, uh, what we actually do in the Unity, uh, we kind of have uh, the feature branches, so-called, like, longer live, but we're also doing trunk-based development. And the idea behind this is, like, even if you have a branch, you should merge the trunk into a branch as often as possible. So you never fall behind. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes plausible, easier, and you basically can follow all these steps. But yeah, the main idea is... Uh, yeah, so um, rebasing regularly your, your, your uh, trunk into, into your branch is a good thing. Um, and, and it's really advisable that you do that. And it's even better if you have a build that does that for you and that checks, uh, that checks this. But still, you don't have the integration between all the parallel branches. So all the parallel branches are still in isolation according to each other. So <laughs> it's already a step in the good direction, but it's not yet continuous integration. Complexity and uh, our own like problems are like the size of the team, so like it's it's a necessary step for us. But yeah, the intention is definitely, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. the trunk based development. It should be the goal. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you.